Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, symposium entitled Forgotten Wisdom. For the first time in the history of ESPID meetings, we ask six senior members to share with us a paper which they found extremely influential or important and which had an influence on their career. And with this, I would like to pass on to Pablo to tell you about the rule. Thank you, Uli. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all. The idea is that the six presenters will present their favorite paper, but there will be no direct question and answer. You can post them on the um, presentation, but there will be no uh, live question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Uli and Pablo. Um, I would like to introduce the first speaker. I'm very honored to be doing that. It will be Adam Finn. He's professor of pediatrics at the University of Bristol and former ESPID president and also very active in the immunity infection course in Oxford. Adam, please give us your first talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation and uh, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Um, so my paper uh, was prefaced by the editors of the journal in which it was published. And I'd like to just start by, uh, by reading you those words. The most important discoveries when familiarized to the mind are contemplated with indifference. Who now wonders at the discovery of America or the circulation of the blood? There is, however, a period between the conception of a discovery and its mature birth, fraught with more pangs than war or women know. And there is no light in which the human mind can be viewed more interesting than during this anxious period. Whenever, therefore, the author of any greatly useful invention details the progress of his own mind during the completion of his plans, the history is perused with avidity. On these grounds, we conclude that our readers will be much gratified by the following narrative. If the slightly dated style and context of those words don't give them away as non-contemporary, you could imagine them to relate to, next, uh, Pablo. To Barry Marshall, the discoverer of Helicobacter and its role in peptic ulceration, and gastric cancer, or Harold Zuhausen, who discovered that HPV causes cervical cancer and spoke at our meeting a few years ago. Both of these noble laureates struggled initially to convince the world of the veracity of their novel insights. Next slide. But in fact, the words that I just uh, read to you, which you can now see, uh, are the preface to Edward Jenner's. Uh, next, please, Pablo. Edward Jenner's paper summarizing his discovery of vaccination, which was published in 1801. Next slide. In the UK, between uh, 0.2 and 0.3 of our population have died of COVID-19 during the last 15 months. In the latter part of the 18th century, upwards of 10% of the population regularly died of smallpox. This was, as Jenner called it, the most dreadful scourge of the human species. These two boys were both simultaneously exposed and actually both have smallpox, but the boy on the right had been vaccinated with Jenner's vaccine and has only a few lesions, if you look carefully, under his left eye. Next slide. Jenner lived in Gloucestershire, next, north of Bristol. It's coming a little slowly on my screen. Next again, north of Bristol where I work. His house is tucked behind the church and adjacent to Barclay Castle, a grand 12th century aristocratic palace. Next, behind the house is the temple of vaccination where Jenner did his work. And when you visit me in Bristol, I will take you there to see it. Next slide. 
Famously, Jenna took material from a pustule of cowpox on a milkmaid's hand and scratched it into the arm of a boy called James Phipps. Next slide. Subsequent inoculation of the boy with material from a smallpox lesion, the standard way to protect against smallpox at the time, and a process that carried not insubstantial risks, but which was still a better bet than risking developing the illness in the wild. This inoculation produced no sign of any response or illness, and Jenna concluded that the cowpox inoculation had protected him. He tried to publish this N equals one experiment, but the paper was rejected. So lesson number one from Edward Jenner is that when your first paper is rejected, don't despair, improve it. Next slide, please. The other thing you may have noticed that is that Jenner used the word virus in his paper. This was written 140 years before viruses were even discovered. And that's, next slide please, that's because the word actually has a pre-virology meaning, literally a slimy poison caused by disease. Although I think the term even in those days had a touch of the concept of contagion in it. Next slide. In his initial work in this field, Jenner quite soon found out that exposure to cowpox through milking affected cows did not reliably result in protection. In his words, this for a while dampened, but did not extinguish my ardor. So lesson number two from Jenner's paper is don't give up when your initial experiments don't work. Next slide. Jenna heard about the idea that cowpox might protect against smallpox from others, but he took the trouble to study it systematically to prove that it works and then to communicate his findings. One of the most conceptually agile and entirely original things that he did was to serially propagate cowpox material from one child to another and show that this material continued to protect, which it did. And this was an inspired idea. Remember, Jenner was living a century before Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. So lesson number three from Edward Jenner is try and think laterally from your first idea. It may well be worth more than you realize. Next slide. Finally, here are the closing words of Jenner's paper. 100,000 persons upon the final last uh, computation have been inoculated in these realms. The numbers who have partaken of its benefits throughout Europe and other parts of the globe are incalculable. And it now becomes too manifest to admit of controversy that the annihilation of the smallpox, the most dreadful scourge of the human species, must be the final result of this practice. So lesson number four from Edward Jenner is try to be like him and think where your ideas might lead in the future. Next slide. Of course, uh, next, of course, Jenner could not then have predicted how this would eventually be done, namely by ring vaccination of contacts of cases and their contacts, leaving the virus with nowhere to go, rather than by universal immunization of everyone everywhere in the world. But he provided the observation, the vaccine, the ideas, and the communication to set the road, to set the show on the road. Next slide. And here he is looking slightly rakish with his jacket buttons half done up, the cows behind him and in the distance, Barclay Castle with his own house tucked right behind. The fifth and final lesson from Dr. Jenner, don't be afraid to be yourself when you face the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, for this presentation. And it's now my great pleasure and honor to introduce the next speaker who is uh, James D. Jerry, who is a emeritus professor from the David Jeffen School of Medicine at UCLA. And um, he doesn't need much introduction. He's a famous PID person and also an honorary member of our society. So Jim, Jim please give us your presentation. <laughs> 
Oh, well, um, so what I'm going to talk about is actually uh, our studies in, on measles uh, in, in St. Louis uh, 50 years ago. Um, and that, that uh, Ralph Flagan and I did uh, and others. Um, next slide, please. And this is the, uh, one of the two papers that I'll be discussing. And what we described was that, that measles had been somewhat eradicated and then it, it came back in a resurgence uh, in 1971. Um, and we were able to describe um, the rates of uh, encephalitis and rates of, um, of pneumonia and death. Um, and then we did sophisticated serologic studies at the time. And next slide. And that's uh, in the companion paper. Uh, and we uh, looked uh, and for the first time using methods at that time, uh, we were able to, to study IgM and IgG uh, antibody responses. Next slide. Uh, and for the first time, uh, we described secondary uh, measles vaccine failure. Uh, and we presented laboratory evidence supporting this using uh, very sophisticated techniques at the time uh, compared to what we would do today. Uh, next slide. Uh, now, measles, uh, once you've had measles, you have lifelong immunity. And Peter Panam, who was a Danish medical student who they shipped off to um, the Faroe Islands. Um, and this is the, uh, actually um, before the germ theory was really recognized, but he made some interesting observation. But the most important was that there was a measles epidemic then, but the people who had been in the previous epidemic 65 years earlier were protected. And so this is the evidence for lifelong immunity. Uh, next slide. Uh, so measles vaccines, this is in the, the, the uh, sequence in the US and the same was true in uh, slightly different timelines uh, in Europe. Uh, next slide. Um, and so the, since the antibody pattern following um, measles vaccine, uh, was found to plateau in a manner similar uh, to natural infection. It was, it was assumed that immunity following vaccine uh, uh, would be lifelong. Uh, next slide. And if, this is a, a slide from uh, uh, Krugman, uh, uh, from uh, Saul Krugman. And if you look up at the top, um, these two, uh, this is one is uh, uh, measles and this is with the original Edmondson B measles vaccine. But then if you look down here with further attenuated vaccine, five years out, um, you're four logs to the base two lower. And so this suggests that things, uh, that the protection with uh, further attenuated vaccines wouldn't be lifelong. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so in St. Louis, we described the, that it would be necessary uh, for a two dose vaccination schedule. Um, and, uh, and the data uh, uh, supporting that, which is actually uh, 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 wrong in retrospect, because we didn't, this wasn't based on serologic evidence or anything. Um, that the pre-vaccine error is wrong. And of course, the failure rate was, we estimated 10%, which is what it was then, but not, not today. And so the next slide. And so here you see what it's, this is from my book. Um, and that we know by age 18, 99% in the pre-vaccine era had had measles. But nevertheless, if you vaccinated 95% of the population, and had a 5% failure rate, you would introduce uh, that with herd immunity, you would eventually start getting cases in adults. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, now, to get the Tudor's recommendation, it took 18 years and two epidemics uh, to get this recommendation approved. Uh, and it it's taken a lot longer, and it took a lot longer in several uh, countries in, in Europe. Next slide. Now, and looking at uh, uh, secondary measles, this is a paper by uh, Matt Zahn and myself using California uh, Department of Public Health data. And if you, the two dose failures, are, you can assume are virtually all secondary failures, and they are much less ill than patients uh, who have primary measles. Um, and as far as uh, cough and coriza, conjunctivitis fever and hospitalizations. Um, uh, next slide. So now just to switch over to measles in Europe, and I don't, I have the, just the data from 15 to 19, uh, and there were 58,000 cases of measles and there were roughly 58 uh, uh, deaths and 58 cases of encephalitis. And from our studies of SSPE in California, we would project that there'd be 58 cases of subacute grossing pain encephalitis. Uh, and the important thing is, is all of these uh, uh, would have and are, and, and are still having uh, post-measles immune amnesia. Uh, and so that leads to increased hospitalizations for other infectious diseases for a period of up to five years. Next slide. Uh, so uh, again, the, the, in looking at this, about half the cases were in adults, which is what we saw much earlier in the US. Uh, and questions are how many were unvaccinated how many were primary failures and how many are secondary failures? I think those are things that are unanswered. Next slide. And in the year 2000, the WHO estimated that there were about 2 million cases of measles in Europe, in the European region. And so when you figure um, after that, um, there would be um, some 2,000 cases of SSPE. And the question is to the audience is how many of you have seen a case of SP, SSPE? And uh, they, these cases are routinely misdiagnosed by neurologists. So unless pathology is done, they get, uh, um, um, they, they are, and um, uh, CSF antibody studies are done, they're not diagnosed. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the, just the summary and conclusions, measles is bad. It's a vaccine preventable disease. It's endemic and endemic in much of the world and in particular in Europe. Uh, next slide, final slide. And this is uh, the walled city of Rothenburg and um, in, in Germany. Um, at the time of a feast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sherry. Fantastic uh, presentation. We move to the next speaker. So this will be Ron Dagan. You know him very well. He's former president of ESPID and professor of pediatric infectious diseases in Shoroka University Medical Center. Ron. Okay, uh, good afternoon, my friends. Uh, as you heard already, two very important papers and you'll hear more about. And um, there are so many forgotten wisdoms and so many influential trials that it's really impossible for somebody who lives already 74 years like me to choose one. So I will be very selfish. I will go to what did something to me and rather than choosing something for the rest of the humanity next. So I uh, will Say, I will tell you a story that, is, that I call a tale of an unimportant publication and individuals caught in trends. Next. Next. And uh, of course, uh, this will be my own perspective, my own experience, my own issue about one paper and instead of unforgotten wisdom, next, I will talk to you about unforgotten wisdom and the first 
point I want to make is that the study that may be considered forgettable by most may be a life game changer for some. And this is the exam. Next. So the story starts about 48 years ago, where started all of a sudden with the improvement of blood cultures, people started to understand that children can be looking not that sick, but can go into work in clinics and get pneumococcus or hemophilus or meningococcus in the blood. And within three years, it became very popular to look for it. And it was termed walk-in bacteremia uh, or occult bacteremia. And people started to say, oh my God, we are, what we are missing if we don't do that? And again, in no time, it was very, very clear that you are not allowed to miss those cases, especially if they are very, very young under the age of three months because they can have serious bacterial infections. And therefore, it has a very important uh, significance if you miss some of those. Next one. And so for the, for the safe, to be on the safe side for all these children not to miss any, within no time, it became sort of the very important rule started in the States and then started to go from there everywhere. Every febrile infant under the age of two to three months of age you have to put him under her or her under rule out sepsis workup, which means hospitalization, blood culture, CSF examination, urine culture, and put the child on the IV antibiotics, wide spectrum for at least 48 hours. And this became, started to become a global trend. Next, so much that when people, very known people like Sarah Long started to write approach and, and guidelines, uh, they use the words which are almost like, uh, you know, almost like the Bible. All patients should be admitted to the hospital. Performance of laboratory test in outpatient is inappropriate. Performance of blood culture in outpatient is inappropriate. Next. So very clear that in no time, standards of care managing febrile infants younger than two to three months of age in early 80s left no room for option. The left picture, which is a nice smiling guy with a little bit of fever who is two months old, is passe, it's outdated. What is trendy now is to take that child, put the child in the hospital and see this type of pictures and imagine what happens if you are the mother or the father and see that picture in your child just because of a little bit of fever. And it was all to be on the safe side for the sake of the child. And I was resident at that time, and then I was a young fellow, and I was following this trend very enthusiastically because I wanted to save all children, like all young people. Next. But then one day, in 1983, there's a paper in a second line journal. It's it was what the, uh, I, I, and that paper was a small paper, it was written by a pediatrician from John Hopkins, Cathy De Angelis, who eventually later on became the editor of JAMA for many years. But at that time, she was a pediatrician in Johns Hopkins. And she called that paper, Iatrogenic Risks and Financial Costs of Hospitalizing Febrile Infants. This was eight years after the whole trend began. And she was posing the question if it's, if it's really safe. But she was very gentle in her words, but not in the fact she presented. Next. In fact, this was so shocking. Look at this. So these are the facts that she presented. 191 febrile infants with 927 admissions under 16 years, days of age hospitalized in the John Hopkins Medical Center for rule out sepsis workup because they were febrile and they did not have an apparent focus. Okay, not very sick children. 20, look at the yellow, uh, the yellow background there. 20%, one out of five of these children had something bad occurring to that child in the hospital during this workup. 20, one of five. And some of those things were very, very serious. Look at this in the red, uh, uh, in the red squares. One disrupt mother secondary to multiple luma punctures. Of course, multiple luma punctures because Luma punctures are done in, the, in these young kids by the first year resident. They have to learn how to do Luma punctures. So, of course, you don't do only one. You do many until you get one successful. And then stolen infant who was never found. Just they lost their child because it was stolen. 
Chlorphenicol sodium succinate induced bone marrow suppression. That was the antibiotic that they used at that time for rule out sepsis, wide spectrum. And then with adventure, look at traumatized infants, secondary to multiple lumbar punctures, two of those. And then one that was kept for 48 hours for neurological uh, consultation that was never done, by the way. And then if you look, 87 of 89, 98% of the infants with no obvious bacterial illness and negative culture stayed in the hospital over three days, just for nothing. And only one of all these may have had a potentially life-threatening illness that was missed on outpatient evaluation and maybe could have been treated if, if discovered later. So I looked at this and I could not believe my eyes. This is what I'm doing? Is this for the sake of the children? And I could not sleep for a whole week. I really, I could not. And I said, I cannot do that anymore. So next slide. The next six years I spent to try to sort out children who do not have to go to the hospital just because they have fever. So the first three years in the, in the paper in the left, identification of the infants unlikely to have serious bacterial infection, although hospitalized for suspected sepsis. And this I did in my fellowship in Rochester. And on the right, ambulatory care of every infants younger than two months of age, classified as being at low risk for having serious bacterial infection. So I made up some um, criteria that next, later were called the Rochester criteria because they were actually uh, started, the first study was in Rochester, but actually they should be, have been called the Beersheba criteria because I thought about this already when I was in Beersheba and trying to get sorted out. And two thirds of those children actually did not have to be in the hospital and could be prevented. Next. But this was not the best criteria. And until now, every year we have more and more paper coming out and more and more people trying to do to find criteria that will put these children out of the hospital because we understand it's not good for the child. It's not for the good for the child to be in the hospital. It's exactly the contrary. Next one. So that paper, that small paper that most of you didn't have never read and those who read it probably forgot changed my life. That was reading this paper, which I made my decision. I'm going to dedicate all my career to prevention. Prevention, next, next slide. The only direction is the prevention avenue. Next slide. And I, and you can check it in my CV. Most, all my life after that came for prevention of hospitalization, either by ambulatory management, shortening of hospitalizations or whatever. And then of course, prevention by vaccine. And this is what I'm doing until now. So my point is very clear. I need to prevent children from seeing even the hospital. If better, even if you can prevent them from seeing a physician. Next. So the unforgotten wisdom for me is the study considered forgettable by most may be a life game changer for some. There is no studies that are unimportant if they are done appropriately. And the second point, and you already saw me next, you already saw me fighting for this uh, two years ago in ESPIT, never follow trends. Remember, your role is to protect your patient, not to follow your friends. Don't go by trends, try to read all the guidelines that are very trendy, very carefully, think about the patient and be thankful to those who write paper for your use. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ron, this was brilliant. And now it's uh, a great honor for me and a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker. This is Maria Zulia. Maria has a long-standing experience in pediatric infectious diseases. She's based at the uh, National and Kabotistrian on University of Athens. She will be our host for ESPID next year, and she spent several years on the um, ESPID board. <coughs> I'm very pleased that uh, Maria will share forgotten wisdom with us now. So please, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Muli. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for holding this interesting session for the first time during the ESPID meetings and for the honorable invitation to participate. 
Uh, I have to admit that it was uh, a real challenge to select one study, uh, one very influential study, uh, because during my lifetime in, in pediatric infectious disease, during the past decades, there have been uh, many, many uh, advances and achievements in the field. Uh, next, please. This is my uh, conflict of interest, next. So I will present you uh, this study shown here, uh, which was published in the New England Journal in year 2000 uh, by Kathleen New Zealand uh, collaborators. And the authors examined the effect of influenza on hospitalizations, outpatients visits, and courses of antibiotics in children. Next, please. Uh, it was previously known that the influenza uh, is a common illness in children and who are the main transmitters of the infection in the family and in the society. But it was considered a trivial illness in childhood, despite the fact that there were already some studies showing high hospitalization rates among young children uh, uh, during the influenza season. But these studies were confounded by the fact that, inf that RSV and other respiratory viruses co-circulated during the winter uh, with influenza. So the aim of the study was to evaluate the burden of influenza in children. Next, please. Uh, this was a modeling study, in fact, uh, a 19 year retrospective cohort study uh, it, that examined only healthy children under 15 years of age. The authors examined the uh, Tennessee Medicaid files where they extracted all the, the uh, dat data required for the uh, study. The primary outcome was hospitalization rates for acute cardiopulmonary conditions, and the secondary outcome outpatient visits and antibiotic courses. They defined the influenza, per influenza, and RSV season during the winter. Remarkably, per influenza season was defined as the period uh, where there was no influenza virus circulating during the winter months. Next, please. So the estimated uh, crude hospitalization rates attributed to influenza by subtracting hospitalization rates during the per-influenza season from those during the influenza season. And they did an additional analysis uh, when the, the, for, during which they excluded person time and events occurring during the RSV season. Next, please. So the results with regard to primary outcome are shown here. Uh, you can see that they subtracted uh, ad hospitalizations uh, during the uh, per influenza season from those during influenza, and they came down with these uh, numbers in the uh, 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 in the blue uh, uh, here. Uh, and then they uh, accounted for the duration of influenza season, and they estimated hospitalizations per 10,000 children per year. And as you can see, hospitalizations uh, for, uh, for younger children were many fold higher compared to the older ones, and particularly for uh, infants under 12 months and under six months of age. And they did this, uh, following that, they did the same exercise by excluding uh, person time and events during the RSV season. And again, th th these numbers here uh, in, the, in table two are comparable with those in table one. So there was no difference in the results. Next, please. With regard to secondary outcome, trends were the same. They showed that uh, there was a, a high number of excess outpatient visits and antibiotic courses, more so in the younger children. And in those under three years of age, up to one third of excess number of outpatient visits and up to 20% of uh, excess antibiotic prescriptions during the winter were due to influenza. Among older children, three to less than 15 years, up to a third of excess antibiotic prescriptions during the winter were due to influenza. Next, please. So they concluded that uh, healthy young children are, are at high risk for influenza hospitalizations and the rates are comparable to high risk groups. And then uh, the second conclusion was that the influenza has a high impact in the outpatient setting um, uh, with excess number of outpatient visits and also antibiotic prescriptions. And they uh, came to the conclusion that uh, the, we should use um, influenza immunization uh, influence immunization for healthy children must be considered. Next, please. Uh, th th this was another study. Uh, to, in fact, there was another similar study in the New England General in the same issue like the um, uh, study by New Zealand, uh, but did not examine the impact in the outpatient setting. A few years later, in 2006, 
Uh, this study was published again in the New England Journal. This time, this was an active prospective study of laboratory confirmed influenza, examined the impact in children under five years of age um, and showed, uh, confirmed the high hospitalization rates and the high rates and the high impact in the uh, outpatient setting with large number of uh, uh, numbers of uh, visits were, which were many fold higher compared to uh, hospitalizations. And remarkably, uh, in both settings, these infections were unrecognized as being due to influenza. Next, please. So in this figure, I, I uh, tried to summarize the findings of the studies uh, that had been published at that time, and uh, it, in this figure, it is the hospitalization rates uh, in different age groups are, are illustrated with yellow are low risk uh, children or adults and with the uh, blue are the high risk groups. So as you can see, uh, hospitalization rates for younger children are high and comparable to those in high risk groups and are also comparable to high uh, to low risk older adults for whom uh, for all these groups, immunization with it for, against influenza was recommended at the time. Next, please. So this these exact studies and these findings were the basis for the recommendation to introduce immunization among healthy children in the United States in 2002 and then in 2004 extended uh, because of the high hospitalization rates in young children. Uh, and then based again on the New Zealand study and other studies uh, that were published in the, in the meantime, uh, regarding the impact in the outpatient setting, the, the recommendation was extended in 2006 to include children, uh, older children under five years of age, and then in the following years to older age groups as well. Next, please. But uh, the uh, debate continues and not and only a few European countries recommend uh, until today the immunization of uh, uh, healthy children. Uh, it is of note that the WHO also recommends many years now the immunization of children under five years of age. Next, please. And in the years uh, that followed, there has been uh, ample evidence that uh, influenza immunization is effective and can prevent hospitalization uh, from this disease. This is uh, a very recent systematic review and meta-analysis uh, published uh, uh, this year by Public Health England, uh, which showed that influenza vaccination provides moderate but substantial overall protection against uh, hospitalization in children. And these findings support annual vaccination. Next, please. And finally, uh, it has been shown, there is also increasing evidence that uh, uh, increased uptake of the influenza vaccine uh, can result in decreased antibiotic prescriptions in the community. This is a study in the US, uh, a national study uh, showing this effect and it's recommended to expand vaccination uh, to reduce uh, unnecessary antibiotic prescribing. Uh, next, please. So I hope I convinced you that this was a very influential study because it shed light on the impact of a common illness that was not previously recognized. The results were soon confirmed by subsequent studies. The study findings led to policy changes and new recommendations for disease prevention with vaccination. And finally, there has been recent evidence uh, that supports the effectiveness of immunization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for those great talks and lots of very, very important papers which you presented on influenza, which we haven't seen in the pandemic, but it will definitely come back. Um, I would now like to introduce the next speaker of the team. It will be Ronald de Groot. He is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics at the Radboud University of Nijmegen. Um, Ronald. Please give us your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. And can you take out this slide and wait for a few minutes uh, before I introduce it? Good afternoon, all of you. When Uli Heiniger asked me to contribute uh, to a session on Forgotten Wisdom, the most influential trial you need to have heard of, it took me a split second uh, to accept this invitation, since it provided me with the opportunity to communicate that trials in itself are not the source of wisdom that have influenced my career as a clinical scientist. So Uli, I will be the anarchist uh, in this uh, session and not discuss a forgotten trial. I will instead discuss a set of papers from two decades ago, their importance for pediatric infectious diseases community 
And I aim to stimulate all of you to read more papers from a gifted teacher and clinical scientist who is the first author of those papers. Arturo Casadevo is professor of molecular microbiology and infectious diseases at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and a wonderful conceptual thinker. Conceptual thinking is the ability to see the big picture and get a better understanding of the context and at the same time to understand how things are associated and connected to identify systems at play and their relationships. In this slide, you see one of a large number of thought-provoking uh, uh, papers of Casadevol uh, with the title Historical Science, which allows me to congratulate the choice of the Swiss organizers of SP2021 to focus on wisdom of the past, which as you can see is completely in agreement with the way of thinking of Casadevol. As quoted here, a better understanding of history can illuminate social influences on the scientific process allow scientists to learn from previous errors and provide a greater appreciation of the importance of serendipity in scientific discovery. History can indeed make science better. Another example of creative thinking by Casadeval is illustrated on this slide and refers to the cause of extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago due to the impact of a huge meteorite followed by an ecological calamity, massive deforestation, and a fungal bloom as the earth became a massive compost. Casadeval convincingly argues in two papers that fungal diseases have contributed to the demise of the dinosaurs. Fungal diseases are possibly more important for clinical practice than many of us think, and I'm therefore very happy that a splendid Bill Marshall lecture this year was yesterday given by Adelia Warris, who is similar to Casadeval, a deep interest in fungal pathogenesis. Before showing the next slide, which the paper from Casadeval selected by me, I would propose that Casadeval provides in this paper a scientific rationale that you cannot be an expert in infectious diseases without an in-depth understanding of the host response and of immunology. My British colleagues have realized this many years ago as reflected by the name of their society, British Pediatric Infection and Immunology Group. Unfortunately, their example is not broadly followed on the continent. The BPIAG is standing on the shoulders of another innovator in pediatric infectious diseases, Professor Richard Moxon, who was, and this is not a coincidence, similar to Casadeval, specialized in molecular microbiology and infectious diseases with an in-depth knowledge of the host response to microbes and vaccines. In the late 20th century, we started to diagnose multiple new infectious diseases that were caused by microorganisms, which are not normally seen in immunocompetent hosts. This raised the awareness that the old concepts of pathogenicity and virulence were inadequate and was the reason for Casadeval and Pierowski to develop a new model to understand microbial pathogenesis. This concept is based on three tenets. First, microbial pathogenesis is the outcome of an interaction between a host and a microorganism. Second, the host relevant outcome of this interaction is determined by the amount of damage to the host. And third, host damage can result from microbial factors and or host response. On this slide from the paper in Nature Reviews in Microbiology, you see the basic parabolic curve of the damage host response framework, which provides a model to understand microbial pathogenesis. The arrow indicates the position of the curve is variable and depends on the particular host microorganism interaction. The y-axis shows host damage as a function of the host response. Weak and strong immune responses both refer to qualitative and quantitative characteristics of the host response. In this example of a microbial host interaction, host damage is magnified both in the presence of a weak and of a strong response. In case of commensalism, the relationship is mutually beneficial for host and microorganism. 
in situations of colonization, damaged baby bin hole, but is there. In situations with latency, for example, granuloma formation by tuberculosis, organ and cellular damage will be present. In the initial papers on the damage response framework, six classes of pathogens um, were described. Pathogens inducing damage only in the presence of a weak immune response, and you see examples here. Pathogens who induce damage in the presence of a weak or a normal immune response. Pathogens who induce damage in the presence of an appropriate immune response and at both ends of the spectrum. Pathogens who induce damage across the spectrum, but damage can be enhanced by a strong immune response. And pathogens who induce damage only in the presence of a strong immune response. Examples of microorganisms associated with one of these curves are shown here. These curves also offer a model to reflect, for example, about the pathogenesis of infections caused by SARS-CoV-2. Do they follow a pattern similar to histoplasmosis with a risk for increased damage in patients with a low immune response or underlying pulmonary diseases, but also possibly an exaggerated immune response resulting in a post-COVID condition in previously healthy patients. These are the microbial response curves of the six classes in the previous slide with examples of microorganisms. Pneumocystis, Carinii, or Yerophagy is well known since the AIDS epidemic. Streptomonia, frequently seen in immunodeficient patients, but also in the presence of a normal immune response. Histoplasmosis frequently diagnosed in immunodeficient patients, but also involved in a prolonged inflammatory syndrome called chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis. Aspergillus is the major pathogen in patients under chemotherapy or transplantation, but also in patients with cystic fibrosis, as you heard yesterday, in an exaggerated immune-mediated uh, disease called allergic aspergillosis. GI tract infections by Campylobacter species are common in persons with normal immune system, but Campylobacter is also involved in the pathogenesis of the Guillain-Barré syndrome. In the paper in reviews uh, in microbiology, Casadeval updated uh, the six classes with three other classes. Example B, shown on this slide, shows a situation where a microbial factor, for example, a toxin, works so quickly that the immune system has no time to respond. The example C and D refer to theoretical situations caused by possible new microorganisms in the future. Microbial damage, as you can see here, can be at the molecular level, the cellular level, the tissue level, organ level, or at the behavioral level, as indicated here. Examples of microbes that induce different types of damage are presented uh, in the paper. Also shown on the bottom of this slide is an example of a damage response curve in which host damage caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis is plotted as a function of time. The conclusion of the paper by Casa Deval are that microbial pathogenesis is the outcome of an interaction between host and microorganism. To the host relevant outcome of this interaction is determined by the amount of damage to the host. Three, host damage can result from microbial factors and or the host response. As shown in the table, the outcome can be either or not of benefit to the host or to the microorganism. I added for your information on the bottom a paper from Casadeval from 2015, in which microbiota are incorporated in the damage response network. Slide out, please. You may ask me why I selected this paper. The answer is that the model proposed by Casadeva clarifies more than anything else the close relationship between pediatric immunology and immunogenetics on one hand and pediatric infectious diseases and microbiology on the other hand. The model is also a wonderful educational tool to teach students about infectious diseases and the host response. Casadeva has written many more challenging papers which you will be able to find on an additional slide. To finish with a quote from Casadeval, 
bring philosophy, PH, back into PhD. Thank you. Thank you, Ron de Groot. Thank you very much for your very inspiring talk. Thank you for your talk. We move then to the next speaker. That will be Hermani Laya. She is our last speaker and she is a well-known SPID member. She has been part of the board very recently. And you know, she's an expert on HIV and CMV that is moving a lot now at the SPID meeting. And she's from St. Mary's Hospital in London. Thank you, Hermani, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pablo. And I just, uh, I don't think the audience is necessarily aware of the fact that none of us knew uh, what the papers were going to be from our colleagues. And I think it's really beautiful. We've had three viruses which we can now prevent smallpox, measles, uh, and influenza. Uh, and we've had the two Rons who both told us about the importance of the host uh, in relation to infections uh, and their responses. And I'm now going to talk about another virus and very much about the hosts in relation to that. And I want to talk about the ARROW trial, uh, which was carried out uh, by colleagues in Africa uh, in the early 2000s. Now, if you go to the Lancet paper, you will see it's very beautifully written, it's very modestly written, uh, and it's all about the numbers. But in these slides, I want to just also bring alive something of the amazing team of people who carried out uh, this trial. Next slide, please. So, Arrow started in 2007, uh, and here you can see some of the, uh, the great people who were there at the very beginning. Next slide. And Watoto is the Swahili word for child. And at that time, only about 28% of children who needed to be on antiretroviral therapy were getting it. And one barrier to getting on treatment was the perceived need that children should be having routine laboratory tests. In resource-rich settings, we were doing blood tests, liver tests, hemoglobins, all the rest of it on children on antiretrovirals every three months or so. Already some trials in adults had suggested uh, that in fact, routine monitoring had only uh, a, a, a small benefit uh, in terms of CD4 counts, but really little benefit in terms of toxicity testing. But we didn't have any data in children. So this was the main trial question. Next slide. But this is an absolutely brilliant trial because it packed in a whole series of questions, not just one. This trial uh, uh, was undertaken uh, and included over 1,200 children. In the Lancet paper, it just talks about the two first randomizations, but you can also see the papers for the third and fourth randomizations. So we looked at whether children were on clinical monitoring or laboratory monitoring. We looked at whether children started on three drugs or four drugs using the available antiretrovirals at the time. The third randomization looked at whether there was an advantage to children in an African setting to be continuing on daily cotrimoxazole. And the fourth randomization uh, was looking at, uh, at changes between once daily and twice daily dosing. Next slide. So this study took place at three centers in Uganda uh, two in Kampala and one in Entebbe, and one center uh, in Harare in Zimbabwe. And the clinical trials unit at the UK uh, was able to uh, bring the data together. And this was a very sick group of young children with HIV. Uh, a third of them were under three years of age. 70% of them had either stage three or stage four disease, and stage four is AIDS. Uh, 
the median CD4 count was 12%, and the median Z score weight for age was minus 2.3. So these were sick, malnourished children. Next slide. And it, all, it almost brings tears to my eyes to, to read through what you can see here. The median follow-up was four years. This was a very long clinical trial and a total of over four and a half thousand child years of follow-up. And only 33 children were lost to follow-up. And during this time, actually, there was a massive cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe, but the clinicians and the trial team went on uh, uh, working through it. At the end of the trial, 95% of the children were still alive and only 5% had switched to second line treatment. Only 1% of them had a CD4 count of less than 5% and nearly 80% of them had a viral load of less than 400. And these are outcomes which at that time would have been dearly beloved uh, for those of us working in resource rich settings. These were absolutely amazing outcomes. Next slide. So as we said, the study was comparing between the laboratory uh, monitoring or clinical monitoring only. And in the clinical monitoring only arm, this was by nurses uh, in, the, uh, in the studies, seeing the children on a regular basis. Overall, there was no significant difference. And you can see particularly most of the significant events, so a new AIDS diagnosis or death happened in the first year. Uh, and then if you look beyond the first year, there were slightly more events uh, in children who were on the clinical monitoring, uh, but this uh, remained within the pre-specified non-inferiority margin. So uh, this is a very important outcome. Next slide. If you look at what happened to the CD4 counts of these children, it's absolutely amazing. They gained more than 300 uh, CD4 cells over time. Uh, and uh, the percentage is also significantly improved. Next slide. Uh, if you look at the viral load suppression, again, you can see it was extremely good and there were no differences. And of course, people were very worried. Uh, Abacavir was used in this clinical trial for the first time in children in an African setting. And clinicians were very worried about side effects, uh, but there was no difference in uh, significant adverse effects. And uh, there were very, very few issues of Abacavir hypersensitivity. Next slide. So the conclusion of the study was that HIV treatment can be delivered safely to children with good quality clinical care and without the need for routine laboratory testing. And if you read in the paper, you can see all the details. And what this really meant was that it was to enable our colleagues to roll out treatment to children uh, and uh, make the very best of getting the treatment to the children rather than uh, spending money on uh, setting up laboratory monitoring. Next slide. So why did I choose the ARROW trial? Well, I chose it because of course, it very beautifully answered the clinical questions that were set up in the randomized factorial trial. But this trial built so much more. It showed us in terms of HIV care, how children could really thrive on treatment with amazing immunological and virological responses. It showed us new kinds of syndromes, such as children with iris, uh, which presented as kwashiorkor. It uh, helped clinicians deal with stigma. It helped us consider how do you consent children who are orphans. There was a huge amount of uh, sub-studies uh, associated with ARROW and uh, including lots of pharmacokinetic studies uh, and all of this contributed to updating the WHO guidelines. There was a great deal of shared learning 
training courses, beautiful films, training films, working with families and young people. Perhaps, though, the most important thing about this clinical trial was how it developed the local expertise. And clinicians who took part in this trial are now uh, clinical leaders uh, in pediatric HIV in Africa. It, helped develop laboratory expertise, statisticians, clinical trialists, uh, ethicists, psychologists, cost-effectiveness expertise as well. And it was, I think, fundamental in ruling out antiretroviral therapy to children in low and middle income countries. So it's a really, really very special trial. Next slide. And this is a very formal picture uh, of those of us who were there uh, when the final results were revealed. And that was a very exciting moment. Uh, and I think in terms of the study, next slide, uh, it was very exciting for those who wrote the paper uh, that their paper was voted BMJ paper of the year uh, in 2014. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, uh, Hermione, for this um, touching presentation. And uh, this actually concludes our symposium. I would like to thank you, Hermione, Maria, Ronald, Ron, Adam, and last but not least, Jim, for sharing your wisdom with us. And uh, I also would, of course, like to thank Michael and Pablo for uh, co-organizing and uh, helping here to moderate. And this was a real life session. If you liked it, please let us know. And um, with this, I would like to close and wish you a uh, beautiful rest of the day. Join us for the next ESPIT sessions and see you at the ESPIT show later tonight. Thank you very much and bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Uli. Thanks, Cheers. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Brilliant. Thank you.